to tell you a little bit about RAFI. Uh, we were founded in 1990, uh, very much a farm advocacy group that believes in justice. Um, we work with uh, primarily today BIPOC farmers, uh, but we started working really in the challenging corporate power era, uh, area, uh, mainly around, we, we really made a name working around poultry contractors and, and helping those farmers and, and those uh, rural communities that were kind of hit hard when uh, those companies didn't give fair contracts to the farmers or they really um, took advantage of those rural areas with some of the, the environmental concerns that we know that sometime were impacted with CAT, uh, CAFOs. So uh, we also have a come to table uh, program. That's our program that works with our faith based communities. Uh, we work with churches uh, to provide um, DSA programs uh, to their congregations, partnering them with, uh, with farmers that are in the area. Um, they have, we work with food banks that are operated by uh, some of our faith-based institutions in that program. The Expanding Farm Market Access Program, again, with our network of over 800 farmers, uh, we oftentimes get asked uh, from co-ops or wholesalers or other markets uh, that are interested in purchasing from BIPOC farmers, you know, who's in our area or we're looking for watermelons or we're looking for this and we can go out to our network and, uh, and try to make those market connections uh, for you all. We also uh, generally throughout the year conduct some buyer connect events uh, where we bring the wholesalers and the farmers together uh, so they can have that space to connect. Our farm advocacy program uh, is one of our uh, main programs here. If you know anything about Benny, Bun Benny Bunting, he has been around a while and is a huge farm advocate. He has saved uh, many of farms from foreclosure, worked with a lot of farmers who uh, uh, with loan appeals and things like that to FSA and, and, and working with USDA to help uh, change those rules so uh, underserved farmers are, are not uh, discriminated as we historically have been uh, by the agency. Policy is another big area for us. We do quite a bit of federal policy work. Uh, all of our policy work is driven by the farmers. We have a farmer, uh, we have an advisory board that are all farmers. They drive the policy that we push uh, in Washington. We was just in Washington last week uh, we took a group of uh, a group of farmers from all over the country. Was part of the rally for resilience, uh, climate smart ag, advocating again on your behalf, and uh, and making sure that uh, when our Congress is working on the farm bill, that they don't forget about BIPOC small farmers. Um, our Just Foods program is a program we have around research around seeds. Uh, we educate uh, uh, folks on the importance of agricultural biodiversity. Uh, as well as consumer choice of uh, diverse public seed varieties. And, uh, and we work with the National Organic Coalition uh, to protect organic integrity, integrity uh, with our organic producers that we serve. Uh, and then of course, the Farm of Color Network. I told you our network is over 800 strong. We're working throughout the Southeast, the Virgin Island, US Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico. Um, Rafi's mission here, challenge the root causes of unjust food systems, supporting and advocating for an economic and racially and ecologically just farm community. Um, so we envision thriving, sustainable and equitable food system. Everything that we do is about making the, the small BIPOC farmer and small farmers more viable where they can stay on the farm and retain their, their land. Uh, we launched the Farmer Color Network in 2017. It was really launched based off of the need that we saw. We work with a lot of small farmers uh, throughout the Southeast and we noticed that farmers of color really were not represented in those spaces. Uh, underrepresented a lot of times uh, in those meetings. And so uh, when we did our granting program, we didn't see a lot of our, our farmers of color applying and, and things like that. And so we launched this network uh, back in 2017 to really, again, concentrate on the BIPOC farmer. Uh, I told you about our service area, benefits of our membership. Uh, again, the FOC and director, I told you how we utilize that, especially with markets. Um, we offer infrastructure grants. This year, we offer infrastructure grants as well as uh, beginning farmer grants. Those periods have closed, but one thing to keep an eye out for is we will be offering some capacity stipends for farmers uh, who are looking to uh, continue their education, rather that be um, some funding that could help you attend a conference, uh, pay for registration, pay for a hotel night, those type of things. So uh, make sure you join our network, make sure you get those newsletters so you can hear about that when it is coming out. Uh, technical assistance, again, big part of our, our service. Um, again, I talked about the policy policy there. Um, you can find us on Instagram, Facebook. We have a Google group that we're creating. And, uh, and I told you a little bit about the, the farmer advisors that drive our policy work. Um, 
Here is a little bit about our technical assistance. Um, Otis is one of our technical assistance providers. Um, if you are looking to apply in Carolina as well, if you're looking to apply for anything dealing with NRCS, FSA, or ERP, the phase two, um, reach out to us. They're there to help to offer that technical assistance, FSA loan applications, emergency relief uh, program. Um, we can help with that. Uh, just a little snapshot real quick about the Pharmacola Network. Just in, from 2020 to 2022, Raffi has awarded $603,300 uh, to help build infrastructure on farms owned by people of color. And we'll get right to our presentation tonight. First we have up is Daryl Tenney. He is the founder and CEO of the Tenney Group uh, LLC, a tax and accounting firm serving clients throughout multiple states across the U.S. with a focus on sustainability and building entrepreneurship and business development within our socioeconomic disadvantaged communities, along with an emphasis on agribusiness development. He is a graduate of South Carolina State University, where he received his undergraduate Bachelor of Science degree in agribusiness. In addition, he has a Master of Business Administration, as well as a Master in Arts degree in Human Resource Development, uh, from Webster University, along with 20 plus years of experience in corporate America. And I just have to say, um, I've heard Mr. Tenney do presentations for uh, several times, and we really wanted to take this time before you all are in the fields and planning to talk about the importance of the business side of farming. That is the biggest thing. And I'm sure you'll hear that tonight, that, that fail family and small farmers as they, we know how to grow, but we also got to understand the business side of the farm. So I will turn it over to you, Mr. Tenney. Well, I want to say, first of all, um, thank you, Mr. Jeff, for the opportunity to be a certain ple a, a pleasure for me to have the opportunity to speak uh, with your um, our audience tonight. Now, I think Anna's going to be queuing up for, for us and stuff. I think I'm going to let her in and give me a few minutes to get her up on. Uh, Anna, you ready? Yeah, um, I'm ready. I just need um, the person that's sharing to stop sharing so I can share. Please. Okay. All right. Okay, so I'll get everything up. Why? While she's doing that, um, I want to say again, it's a pleasure. Okay, uh, can I, I just want to make sure everyone so y'all can see it. Okay, Mr. Jeffrey and everything. Now Anna's off. She's off site, but she's going to be advancing for us. So I say next slide, please. Well, again, tonight we're going to talk to everyone about the Arab business way. As Mr. Jeffrey said, it's that time of year now. We're getting ready to plant and everything, but it's also that time of year for, for as we look at for taxation for business and structure. And what we're going to talk about tonight is what we call the agribusiness way. And as everyone sees here, we have that big trademark behind that. We actually trademark that, that logo, the agribusiness way, because um, as I say, I'm the Red Tenney, and we are, and we serve farmers throughout the country. We're located here in Raleigh, North Carolina. We have offices in North Carolina, South Carolina, uh, Shannon, Mississippi, and also Arkansas. And we're looking to launch our Texas, and also we're working at, looking to do a West Coast operation pretty soon. But we work with farmers across the country. Now, we even Puerto Rico work with farmers out there now as well. And we want people to understand that our mission is to educate and empower everyone and understand accountability to ensure sustainability with the solid foundation. We want people to understand what we mean by that solid foundation, okay? The biggest thing is we look at agriculture totally differently now. And we, I always say we may have to uh, redefine that word agriculture and define the word agribusiness. What does it mean to be agribit for agribusiness men and women, okay? So have to give this disclaimer, next slide, please. We have to always give the disclaimer as we start. Um, Anna, can you hear the next slide? And I'm sorry, we're going to, she's going to yeah. be advancing for us, okay? Uh, just one minute here, hopefully we we'll get this thing. Okay, all right, okay. The information you are here today regarding the entity is for tax purposes only and its relation. We are not lawyers, but we can recommend you lawyers we work with that can provide you with legal advice and information. We do have attorneys that we work, for, work with uh, for our clients, okay? Now, the next slide, please. Um, the purpose of this is to, uh, you know, to provide consultancy and training service in financial um, planning and business management, okay? To empower, educate, and assist in developing solid foundation. What does that mean to be a foundation as we're going to get into? Best business practices and structures and identify and develop solid financial management strategies through training and professional development. As we're saying, we are trying now to develop and get an understanding of how agribusiness works. Okay, next slide, please. Now, 
one of the things that we're going to talk about today, so you were told you was a business entity. What does that mean to you? Okay. We're going to talk about these things called entities. We're going to talk about these things because a lot of our farmers operate not as an entity, but as individuals. Next slide, please. So we're going to talk about tonight, sole proprietorship, partnership, S corporation, nonprofit, C corporation, and limited liability. And we always ask people uh, this thing called an LLC. You know, a lot of cars I was in Sea Island on Saturday, I was in Alabama on Friday, I was in Puerto Rico, past three days giving conferences. And when we, when we have people, we ask people how many people have LLCs, everyone raised their hands up. Most of everybody said, I got an LLC. But we ask asking people the next question how many people have the EIN number for these LLCs? We don't get a, quite a few, but when we ask that question, how many people know how many ways you can file an LLC? We see very few hands go up. But this is one that's got a lot of people in trouble. Understand LLCs, okay? Now, next slide. We're going to talk about tonight um, from this thing called an EIN form. Same thing. We ask people, how many people got an EIN number? Okay? The SS4 form certain are called as an EIN number. This is the most important piece of paper you can have in existing business and for new and beginning ranch farm is that employee identification number, okay? Repeat that. This is the most important piece of paper you can have is that EIN, okay? Now, why? You can put your name and address, but when the problem have people with problem with 9 a when you start checking, what type are you, okay? If you check sole proprietorship, you just told the IRS that now I'm going to be taxed as a sole proprietor filing Schedule C or Schedule L, okay? If you check partnership, you just told the IRS now I'm going to file as a partnership. If you check corporation, you just told the IRS I'm going to be filing at 1120. If you check church, you just told the IRS, as long as I recognize church, I don't have to file taxes, but you'd be surprised how many churches are trying to file taxes. Now, the EIN number, is when people say, when I go down to Secretary of State, we're talking, and I file such and such at the Secretary of State, and I did it federal. No, you did not. And when you go to state, you only talking to the state. Here's where you're talking to the federal side in identifying your entity. Again, this is where people mess up the most. Now, next slide, please. When you apply for that EIN number, you're going to get this letter here that no one reads, okay? This is the most important, paper, very important paper. When you apply for your EIN number, you're going to get a confirmation. You must keep this letter. A lot of people tell me because this is telling me, telling us what is your filing requirements. And look at this letter right here. I know it's a sole proprietorship because if it was an entity, it would have form and a date in the middle of it. But please remember this piece of paper because we're going to come at this. Remember the third paragraph. We're going to come at this piece of paper here. Next slide, please. We're going to talk about now a sole proprietor. Many of our farmers and community, we operate as sole proprietors. But remember now, sole proprietors, also called independent contract consultant or freelancer. One person operation, the business may have a number of employees or hired person, but the proprietor only runs and manages business. No farms are required to start this business, only report income and expense on a Schedule C or Schedule F. Next slide, please. Now, the thing about a sole proprietorship, it is you. If, you, if you're a sole proprietor, it means you are receiving all funds. You all have unlimited liability. Very easy to organize, but it has unlimited liability. Now, if you have ABC Farms today and as an LLC, ABC Farms made $100. But guess what? ABC Farm as a sole proprietor didn't make a dime. You, the individual, made $100. You, the individual, has a liability, and you, the individual, are carrying all the responsibility of income. As I say many times, it's not how much money you make. It's how you receive the income you make. But as a sole proprietor, you are receiving. And one thing about our farming community, we do not keep up with our records. We must keep good records. Okay, now I'll repeat that. We must keep good records. Now, again, as a sole proprietor or a farm, if your farm made $100 a day, you say, look, I came out here, I drove so-and-so to hear this conference or training, and I spent $50 in fuel. Well, next time this year, your tax income will be $50. Now, you say, well, on my way to, to this training, I stopped by my local Walmart and I didn't know if I'm going, I'm going to have anything right with it. So I went and spent $20 in office supplies. Next year this time, your tax income is going to be $30. Get back to your farm this afternoon, and guess what? You have a, a water main break or a leak or a pipe or something burst. And you spent $40 in repair and maintenance on your farm. But guess what? Next year this time, your tax income should be Zero. Because if you said I had 
I had I'm not farming a hundred dollars a day. I spent fifty dollars in legal tax deduction in fuel, twenty dollars in office supplies, and forty dollars in repair man. If my math is right, you made a hundred dollars a day, but you had legal tax deductions of one hundred and ten. You have zero taxable income next year. There are things called legal tax deductions, and we say all the time. We get people coming all the time and say, well, I went down so and so down the street, so and so here, and they said they were gonna get they was gonna hook me up. But some people come to our office so hooked up, we can't get them unhooked sometimes. So you don't have to get hooked up because you have legal tax deduction to reduce tax income. Another problem many people make, even as a sole proprietor, they thinking that when you start this business, you got to make money before you can start utilizing legal tax deduction. But there's a thing called startup costs. You got to spend money to make money. So if you're starting your business today, you went to Walmart to buy a book, you came back home and said, I got to call and see how do I start this business, and I'm actually starting my business, guess what? When you drove to Walmart, you take fuel tax deductible. You bought the book, tax deductible. Your computer got home, tax deductible. And the cell phone you use, possibility tax deductible. People don't understand. When you start a business, Keep your records of the cost in starting that business because you can utilize those legal tax deductions to offset personal income. Again, that's called startup costs. Okay. So again, owner receives our benefit and owners receive all profit. I'm going to say it again, as a sole proprietor, we are telling people, we are trying to train people now to understand. Sometimes operate as a sole proprietor, you receive all the income. You respond for all our bills, but you're receiving all the debt because everything is your name as a sole proprietor. So next slide, please. We want people to understand how we how we change it. Now, this form is called a Schedule C, Ordinary um, Business Profit Loss from Your Business. Now, let me say this very clear. If you are in any type of agricultural operation, this is one form you do not use. Let me repeat that. If you are in any type of agricultural operation, you never use a form Schedule C. This is for ordinary business, okay? Now, look at line one. I want people to remember that line called gross receipts on a Schedule C. We're going to show you why you never use this form in agriculture, okay? Next slide, please, okay? Now, these are all your legal tax deductions. Next slide, please. This is all your legal tax deductions, okay? Um, car and truck. Commission, contract labor, depletion, depreciation. We'll talk about it a few little bit later. Employee benefits and programs. Next. Now, we're going to talk about um, insurance, interest, legal and professional fees, all legal tax deductions for ordinary business. No, um, uh, thanks for rent and lease, repair. Uh, I, I think we're going too far out. Go back two slide. I'm sorry, you guys. Go back two slide. Go one more slide. Okay. We're going to talk in interest. I think we just went. Rent and Okay, I'm sorry, you guys. We got a little tip going on. Interest, legal and professional fees, office expense, pension and profit sharing. Next slide, please. Pension and profit sharing. Okay. Rent and lease, repair and maintenance, supplies, taxes and license, travel, meals, entertainment, utilities, and wages. Now, we always stop at wages because a lot of people don't understand once we start structuring your entity, once the entity is structured correctly, you want to pay yourself from your from your from your from your farms. Okay. If you can. Now, reason being, you're paying Social Security, you're paying Medicare, but you're also paying unemployment, okay? Because you can, as an employee of your entity, you qualify for unemployment, okay? So these are ordinary business expenses we want people to understand. Next slide, please. Now, we're going to talk about farm income and farm expenses. What does that mean for farm income and farm expenses? Next slide, please. Now, in agriculture income, this is the only way you report agriculture income, okay? One, sales of livestock and other resale items. Two, costs and other basis of livestock or other items reported online. A, you got a little minus side beside because basically what we're saying, if you bought a bull for $2,000 and you sold that bull for $4,000, you want to subtract the cost basis, okay? Now, sales of livestock and produce, grains, and other products you raise. Now, we always stop here because people get one and three mixed up. One says sales of livestock and other recent items. If you bought some tomatoes from Walmart and you took those tomatoes to the, to the farmer's market and you sold them, 
Here's where you report that income on line one as resale item. If you raise those tomatoes and you took them to the farmer's market and you sold them livestock for the grants you raised, you report the income on that line. Here's the important why. Many programs are based on agricultural production. If you put all your income on line one, you did not produce anything. You bought it for resale. You're not a farmer. You are a reseller. But if you produce this, this if you raise these tomatoes, this corn, this, this soybeans, cotton, you replace that income on line three. Now, when you go apply for FSA programs, crop insurance, it's not, we talk about I am a crop insurance agent. If you apply for crop insurance, your programs and insurance is based on production income. Many of our farmers mess up by sticking on the first line. You are not a farmer. You are a reseller. You didn't raise anything because the income you said was I bought it in for resale. I received it from price I, I bought. Many farmers are messing themselves up by putting one and three. And also, many of our farmers who make hundred thousand dollars, they could be to say I want to put twenty thousand dollars on my on my on my return. Do stop doing that. My farmers need to report the actual income because you're only going to be taxing what you got left over. We'll talk about that. Three corporate distribution per, per distribution. Agriculture program payments, commodity credit, crop insurance, CC loans, crop insurance proceeds, and federal crop disasters. I am a crop insurance agent. We license in 15 states, and I write crop, you know, crop insurance. Okay. Now, custom hire, other income and gross income. In agriculture income, this is the only way you report agricultural income. Never on that one line, you must itemize your income. And identify where it comes from, and we're gonna show you important why. Next slide, please. Okay. Now here's your legal agricultural expenses. Okay, car and truck, chemicals, conservation expense. We get this all the time. You know, can I write conservation expense? I'm gonna get a 10 out of nine. Most situations, yes, you are gonna get 10 to 9. But the first thing people say, well, I don't want to report it because I don't want us know I got it. Well, you got it, the IRS already know you got it. Okay, so it's best that we report it, but we're gonna show you about why you why you report it. Because if you got $50,000 in fence and you spent $49,000 on, on, on putting the fence up, your taxable income is only on $1,000. But if you've got $50,000 in fencing and you spent $51,000 in putting the fence up, how much was your taxable income? Zero. There's no taxable income. You only pay tax on what's left over or earned income. Okay? Let me repeat that. Custom hire, depreciation. All farmers should be utilized depreciation. Depreciation reduces taxable income, but you always add depreciation back in. Okay. If your farm made $10,000 and you had $20,000 depreciation, your farm actually made $30,000. Okay. If your farm lost $10,000 and you had $10,000 depreciation, your farm actually made $10,000. Okay. You always add depreciation interest back in. Now, again, depreciation carry over the life of a piece of equipment. Because you're recapturing depreciation because you're recapturing a um, capital expenditure over $10,000 through depreciation, okay? So one of the things we want people to understand, each year you're going to have a depreciable amount that you can claim, but you always add that being after, after your financials. We'll talk about that, depreciation. Employee benefit, fee, fertilizing line, free and trucking, gasoline, fuel, oil, insurance, other than health, mortgage interest, other interest, labor hire, pension and profit sharing plans, rent or lease. Every year we do we do our taxation for clients around the country. All of our offices around the country, we ask all the questions because we know agriculture. And we a lot of times we get people come in here with rent and leases, pay for rent. So we ask them, we don't see your receipts or we don't see your documentation showing your rent. The first thing they say, well, I didn't get a receipt. Why? Because the person that I pay my rent from, buy rent land from, they tell me to put a little something in their hands. So guess what? Everything you put in your hands could be disallowed and you're gonna be taxed for everything you put in your hands. Because if you're disallowed from cash income and you don't have receipts, then that's going to be, if you get audited, then they're going to report you as making that as your taxable income, you personally. And, you, and you're going to have to claim that as income. So you always want to get a receipt when you're paying rent or lease or anything. Okay? Vehicle machine equipment, land animals, repair and maintenance, season plants, storage and warehouse and supplies. Always stop here. Every year we ask our, our, our agribusiness men and women, for documentation or for where's the receipts with it. Well, I gave it to you. I gave it to you in supplies. But everything is not a supply. 
You know, we deal with a lot of artists and stuff. And the first thing they say, it don't make sense. So if you made a hundred thousand dollars growing tomatoes and you put ninety thousand dollars as applied, that don't make sense. Artists are doing random, can't speak the IRS, can't speak for them, but artists are doing random, but you can sure spark one. Okay. Here's the reason why. That doesn't make sense because where's the seeds? Where's the plants? Where's the fertilizer? Where's the chemical? Where's all the other items needed to grow this commodity? So these are things that you look for itemization of your expenses. So we tell people all the time, make sure in your record keeping, you keep good records, but itemize these records to what category they fall in, and we'll tell you how to handle that as well, okay? Season plant storage supplies, taxes, utilities, and veterinary breeding and medicine. These are all your legal tax deductions. We tell people all the time. So many of our farmers come want to operate under the table. We tell them, get from under that table, I was in that table too. They're looking under that table now too. So we want you from under that table and do it and get on top of that table because laws are written for people who make money. Laws are written for businesses to gain edges by utilizing legal tax deduction. Next slide, please. Now, if you're in any type of agricultural operation, this is the only form you use, a Schedule F. I work with farmers around the country, and I'm telling you, we have farmers, I just was in a farmers in Texas last week, got next week, they're using Schedule C's and they are down on calamity. You do not use the Schedule C's. We work with farmers out of May. They say we some never heard of a Schedule F. If you're in any type of agricultural operation, you only use a Schedule F. We're going to tell you why all the way through. Now, here's why. Look at this Schedule F here, okay? Here's how you report agricultural income. You remember that Schedule C? One line, gross receipts. So many of our agribusiness men, men and women are paying taxes they don't owe, okay? Because number one, you, here's what I was talking to you about, sales of, uh, of recent items. Now, 1B, you got to put the cost basis. Now, if you put everything on line C, guess what? Those from resale production. But look at number two, sales of lots of produce grants you raised. Here's number two, where you put that income. Now you are receiving money and reporting income from production receipts of raised commodities. One says what you bought, you're not a farm, okay? So these are things that we are saying, a production farm, I should say. Now, look at 3A and 4A, 5A and 6B with crop insurance. There are some programs that you receive that may not be 100% tax. okay? You may receive $10,000, remember that 1099? But if you receive, for example, agriculture program came in 4A for $10,000. But if you only say $1,000 that is taxable, then on 4B, you put $1,000. Now, if it's not taxable at all, you put the $10,000 on 4A, but 4B, you put zero as taxable amount. Here's where a lot of farmers around the country are not utilizing and filling out Schedule F correctly. You must understand, here's why you don't use a Schedule C. You must itemize income and like crop insurance and like 4A, 4B, you may not be taxed. That may not be taxed that year. Crop insurance, if you qualify for factors, you can receive $100 of crop insurance, but you're deferring it for this year, there's zero taxable amount. Or you can receive $100,000 but only $20,000 is taxable. Here's why you use a Schedule F, okay? Here's how you report agricultural income only on a Schedule F and part two legal expenses, okay? Now, again, we're saying we want you to understand tax deductions or legal tax deduction will reduce taxable income. We got farms all the time come say, well, I loan my farm money, I transfer money, but you do not add that up in on gross receipts. That's not taxable. Only earned income is taxable. Okay, next slide, please. Now, all right, quickly, we're going to talk about um, uh, 4835. Uh, this is forms that are used for people who are renting land. You could use a Schedule F or 4835. A lot of people use Schedule F, but this is 4835 farm rental income and expenses. Next slide, please. Now, one of the things we want people to understand, I just stated, record keeping actual crucial. Okay, profit and loss statement, balance sheet, cash flow, trial balance, and general ledger. This is a book that we will provide all our farms. Okay, we give them in one book. In this book, it's going to give you your PL, profit and loss, your balance sheet, your cash flow statement, trial balance, general ledger. These is, is one thing that we have to build in our community is proper record keeping. Okay, and we must understand 
we got to keep good records to know where we at. We got to keep good records for production, weight, everything to do with agriculture. But one thing about keeping good records, you need to know what your finances are. You need to know where you're at today, where you're going tomorrow, and where you came from yesterday. And this is what banks want. And here's one of the reasons that we fought, you, we formed this booklet for our clients and farmers so you can have all your financial records. So when you go to any institution and try to grow your business, the first thing they won't tell you, they're not because you don't have financial records, okay? Now, next slide, please. Right, quickly, we're going to talk about these records, okay? What a profit and loss statement is. It's also an income statement. For the lack of time, we'll read the whole definition. It's a financial statement that details income and expenses. Next slide, please. Here's how a financial statement looks. Here's your income and the categorization, all of your expenses. But the biggest thing about this, come December 31st or January when we get your last financial statement, this is your tax return. You don't have to go look for anything. The only thing we have is a client, you have no kids. We have no kids, we keep it moving. This is your tax return because here's all the information. You ain't got to go look for nothing. You already knew what you had the whole year because we work with this with our clients through the entire year. Okay, here is your tax return. Categorize everything you use and your income and expense. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, now the one thing we're gonna look at that balance sheet. All financial institutions, the first thing I'm gonna ask you for your balance sheet. Okay, that provides a snapshot of company owns or owes, as well as the amount invested by shareholders. The balance sheet is absolutely crucial in financial ins institutions. Next slide, please. Here's how your balance sheet looks. Now, everybody's balance sheet gonna look different. Okay, your current asset versus your current liability. The categorization of this category will change, but this is your balance sheet. It shows what you have, what you owe, and what you own. Okay, and most institutions are going to ask you. I'm sure everybody heard. I need a balance sheet. Okay, we heard these big bank failures recently, and the first thing they say they should have been looking at the balance sheet. How can you fail when you have a balance sheet telling you what you own and what you owe? Okay, that's the biggest thing about balance sheets. Okay, next slide, please. We talked about the trial balance, the cash flow refers to as the net amount of cash equivalent being transferred in and out of your company. That's your cash flow. Okay, how do you look? How, are you cash flowing? I'm sure people, banks or institutions, say, are you cash flowing? Okay, next slide, please. Now we're going to talk about that thing called a trial balance. Okay, that is a book we use. We don't like to work bookkeeping. We say financial statements, but bookkeeping worksheet in which balance of all ledgers are compiled into debt and credit account columns holding the equal, debt and credit, debit, um, debit and credit. Okay, next slide, please. And this is one thing that is a more is very important, that general ledger. It shows you what you did from January 1st to December 31st, every day of the year, every account. Represents a record-keeping system for a company of financial data with debits and credits account records validating that trial balance. That is your general ledger, everything you spend on, okay? Now, this is your financial statement, and this is why record keeping is absolutely important, okay? Now, we're going to talk about what a partnership looks like as well, an aggregate two or two okay? Two or more persons contribute to the asset and business and may share. Now, this is called what we call a general partnership, okay? Next slide, please. Similar to a sole proprietorship, but it's two or more owners. Very easy to organize, okay? Better find strength in a sole proprietor, but it's two or more individuals. But as a partnership, what we call a general partnership, that's considered a 1065. It's still drilled down to the owner, okay? This is called a general partnership. We have people coming all the time. Me and my friends, we ate together, slept together, ran together, did everything together. And we want to go into business together. And they ask us, what's the best way? And a lot of people, well, I'm going to form a general partnership. But I tell people all the time, you may do all that things together, but one thing you never did together, you never made money together, okay? So we want our farmers to understand that, but we're going to show you the best way to get set up, okay? Now, next slide, please. Now, as a general partnership, you're going to follow Form 1065. Now, let me repeat this again. In any type of energy structure you have, you always use a Schedule F and attach it to the 1065 if you choose a partnership. Now, K-1, next slide, please. A partnership or S-corporation is going to give you a K-1 form. You cannot do your personal tax return, but got to get a K-1 form. Because this is what they call a pass-through because on line one, it's going to tell you income and expense. Did you gain money or you lost money? This has to be reported on your personal tax return. So remember that number you check partnership, you're going to file a 1065, but you've got to have a, a K-1 form as well. Okay? Now, 
we're going to get into the, to the big boys. Next slide, people. Okay. We're going to get into what these things we were talking about these entities. Okay. Corporations are person who established a legal entity by the Audits and Corporation of State Secretary grant of certain legal power, rights, privileges, and liability. As corporation, the eligible domestic corporation that wants to avoid double taxation. Okay. Inc., if you have a company that pays taxes and payroll taxes, that's double taxation. That's corporation does it. Okay. S corporate is not a sole partnership or a partnership. Okay. Here's what I just read. All right. When you go to your Secretary of State, your Commonwealth, and you follow articles of organization, you just file that in that state a limited liability company. Now remember, if you follow articles of incorporation, you just file a corporation within that state. But I want people to remember, a LLC is not a corporation. It's an organization of a group of people. Okay. A LLC is not a corporation. It's an organization of a group of people. A ISC is a corporation. Next slide, please. Okay. Now, one thing I want people to understand about these LLCs. LLCs have some characteristics of a partnership and some characteristics of a corporation. A LLC may be organized to avoid double taxation, which frequently comes to S corporation. Okay, S corporation does not pay taxes. Okay, the owners of LLC are called members and managers. LLCs are managed by members or managers who may or may not be members. This, this is a distinction. Okay, me and Mr. Jeffrey and Ms. Evans form a limited liability company, and we say, guess what? Ms. Evans is the smartest one of all. We're gonna make her the manager. But guess what? Now we just became a managed managed LLC. But Mr. Jeffrey might say, hold on, I don't know y'all like that. So we all going to make decisions. We just became a member managed LLC. Those are your distinctions if you identify a person or a manager. Now, but here's where people have problems with limited liability companies. Next slide, please. Know what we're doing. But the one thing about an LLC where people don't understand. Next slide, please. A limited liability company can choose to file a sole proprietorship partnership or elect to be taxed as an S corporation. Here's where people have all the problem with LLC. Because you can choose which way you want to file. Has restriction apply hundred people can be owned by a corporation can be treated as partnership for federal tax purposes. Earnings may be subject to second farming tax if you are a sole proprietor. When people fill out that these limited liability companies and they file this organization the first thing is say, I went to the Secretary of State and I'm already talking to IRS. No, you're not. You're only talking to the state. Okay? You're only talking to the state. But that thing called EIN number, here's where you set that foundation. Because if you check that box wrong, guess what? You're going to be reclassified. But what people don't know, when you fill out a limited liability company, or RIC, but for LLCs we're talking here, next slide, please. You got 75 days to fill this form, 25, 53 hours. Election to be taxed as an S corporation. If you do not fill this form out, you're going to be denied. Unless you write across the top of that form in pencil, crown, blood, and ink, follow pursuant Rep. Prop 2013-30. That is a late filing of procedure. If you do not file this form within time, you're going to be denied. Unless you write across the top of this form, Filing pursuant Rev Proc 2013-30. Okay? Now, this is that late revenue procedure. Well, here's where people have problems with that thing called uh, that EIN number. Okay? Because when you are filling that EIN number out, if you are a single member LLC, in most situations, it's going to ask you, are you a single member or multi-member? Now, when you form these LLCs, you want this to be you, and this is the LLC. That is most people intent to be separate, okay? But what happens is you have the LLC protection, but your taxation, you want it to be separate, all right? But when they ask you, are you single member or multi member, most people, one person, say, I'm a single member. Ain't nothing wrong with that. It's going to ask you, are you a single member or multi member on your EIA application? Most people are going to put, if it's two or more people, where well, we're a multi member. But here's the problem. When you check that you are a single member LLC, you just told IRS to be taxed as a sole proprietorship. When you check that as a multi member, uh, 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 multi member, you just told IRS, I'm going to be filed as a 1065 partnership. You should have checked corporation because your intent 
supposed to be separate from yourself. And now you tell the IRS that I want to be taxed as a corporation. When you've got that letter no one reads, it's going to clearly tell you you need to file a 2553. Okay? That is the reason why a lot of people got the LLCs messed up because they don't understand when you got that EIN number, you told them you wanted to be the sole partnership or a partnership, but you didn't fill check the box at a corporation. You should have checked corporation. Okay? Now, hit the second page is very, very crucial. We're going to talk about that as well. Next part. Here it says who owns this corporation? Who owns this entity? Okay? A lot of people, we see a lot of people all the time. If you are, whoever have the highest percentage of ownership controls this entity. Whoever, if you want somebody to have 15% and you have the, the, the remaining balance, that's fine. You want somebody to have 2%, you have 98%, guess what? That's who controls the entity. But every year we have people come in the office not understanding that the person who has a controlling interest has controlling rights as the LLC. We have families come in all the time. We always say, well, some got a good child, a bad child. And we always say, fathers know every year who they want to have what. Mothers say, I want my babies to share equally. But you got to remind them that whoever has controlling interest will be in control. All right. But here's how we pass it down generation. And another thing about establishing an entity and having entities is because a lot of people have limitation of income. Guess what? If you say, I, I can only make so much amount of money, guess what? This LLC can make a million dollars. It received the money and not you. Okay? You did not receive it a dime, the LLC. You only receive what you pay yourself from the LLC. Okay? Now, we have people who remember, you're going to get a K-1 form. We get this question all the time. Should my husband or wife, should we have an LLC 50-50. There's no problem with that, but I tell people when you're applying for programs, you have to have husband information or wife information. Now, if you love each other, you're not going nowhere, it's good to say, put it in one, per one person's name because it's married for joining and his asset. But if, you have, if you're not sure, you have doubt, you might want to put in two people in there, okay? But I would say this very clearly. The best thing to do with farming these limited liability companies, it's not wrong with one person carrying in their, in their name. Now, we got to understand that. Here's why we have children who are up north and children out west. Like I'd be out in Arkansas, everybody's in Detroit out there every year. Everybody's in Philadelphia, New York. And we have families now say, can you talk to my son? And can you talk to my daughter? Because they can be in New York, they can be in Chicago, and they can own, have an interest in an LLC family farm back home. Okay? If you're, if you're in New York, you work with Google, you make $200,000, and your farm lost $10,000. Now your tax income is at only at $190,000. Now, if you up there, out, out the children are away, and you make twenty thousand, and your farm made twenty thousand, now your net worth has increased by twenty thousand dollars, or what your what percentage your ownership is. So here's where we get a lot of calls now of families saying, "Wait a minute, you mean tell me I can be away and still have an interest in my farm at home?" Absolutely. The land price is already paid for. That it's been there for years. So guess what? It has value. If you form this LLC, instructional right, you already have value, you already have ownership in your family farm. Okay? So we got to remember now, here's why this is this piece of paper is very important. Now remember, next slide, please. You remember that piece of paper I tell you, no one reads? Guess is why? Because it clearly tells you here online on the, in the third paragraph where it says, it must file timely form 2553 election for a small business corporation. No one reads this piece of paper right here, okay? So we tell you very clearly, this is very, very important in understanding. Please, your entities are very important to you. Your entities, now, you can, if you have problems, we do have problems sometimes, but guess what? If you have an entity, you can always, you have ABC Farms today, you can always start ABC D Farm tomorrow, okay? Because the entity carries the liability, not the individual, okay? An entity can go bankrupt, not the individual. Okay, so you can always reset yourself. You can't reset yourself, but you can always reset the entity. Okay, always. That's the importance of having interest. Some entities, one may ten thousand dollars, one may lose ten thousand dollars, offset, and that way you have multiple streams of income. But it's very, very important understanding how entities work for an organization. Next slide, please. Okay, now S corporation double taxation avoided, free and restricted. But again, S corporation all aspects accept. A S corporation pays no income tax. No, S corporations do not pay income tax. Okay, that's one thing. It's paid through the shareholders. Next slide, please. Okay. Now, next uh, 
One thing about this is your 1120S, okay? If you are have an S corporation, you file 1120S, but what do you still do? Schedule F. You always file a Schedule F and attach it to the 1120. Never fill this piece of paper out further. You still use the Schedule F and attach it to the 1120. Okay, next slide, please. Okay. Now, if you are a K-1 form, remember, you cannot file your personal tax return without getting the K-1 form. Corporations are due March 15th, personal due April 15th, non profit due May 15th. But you cannot file your, you file your corporate tax return without filling out your corporate, getting your K-1 form to put on your personal return. Okay, next slide, please. Okay. Now, um, C Corporation. Life is perpetual, but double taxation. A C corporation, if gains are made, are going to pay taxes, okay? And you pay payroll taxes, that's double taxation. Next slide, please, okay? Now, we're going to talk about 1120. Remember that if you have a C corporation, you don't fill out 1120S, you fill out 1120. But remember, you still fill a Schedule F and tax to the form, okay? Here's where you file the C corporation. Next slide, please, okay? Now, in home office is very important. Next slide, please, okay? Now, in home office, total, total qualified deduction of area of home used for business, but regular as an inclusive. I'll read the whole thing next slide for you. If you have your home in home office, 13.1, 2.9, or 11.12, now you can write 11.12% of the home mortgage interest, real estate, utilities, insurance, and rent. Okay. Any portion of, and that percentage of any repairs and your office portion house. This is called a in home office. Now, next slide, please. Here's where you file in-home office, 8829. Next slide, please, okay? Now, one thing about what we're saying is these are forms a lot of our, and getting close, wrapping up, these are forms a lot of we, we miss in our community, okay? Next slide. A form 982, a lot of people get 1099C, okay? And first thing people say again, I don't want to ask no, yes, they do, you already got it. But one thing about a 1099C, if you put it on your person, you're supposed to be, it's been charged off to you and you were supposed to report that on your person as income. Well, guess what? If you get that 1099C, put it on a form 982. And you see that box say C, discharge due to farm indebtedness, it goes away. Because if you qualify, it's excluded for your income. A lot of people are receiving 1099Cs and paying taxes and wiping out refund. Why? Because they're putting it on the wrong form. Put it on a 982. Checks box C, discharge due to qualified farm indebtedness. If you qualify, it could be excluded. Okay. But you can also use for personal sovereignty, um, indebtedness of a standard of insolvency, and also uh, personal property. But you can also use personal. But for tonight, we're talking about Form 982 to avoid paying those 1099Cs as income. Okay. Next slide, please. Form 843. You can ask for an abatement. A lot of people get penalized. First thing people say, I didn't know my corporation was due on 315. Guess what? If you didn't know, you're going to get fined, okay? Because it's due March 15th. But if you do, file an 843, ask for an abate, okay? Ask for abatement of those penalties, okay? Now, another thing about, about abatements, you can always go back and to remember to amend a tax return. If you didn't feel that right, if you learned something like that, you can go back and amend that return, okay? You can get three years with over to you, two years if you're paying something in. The biggest thing that we see is a lot of people don't want to get garnished, right? If you get garnished, the reason you get garnished is for you to respond. People come out all the time. They took everything out of the bank. This is the first thing I got. Well, it's got a big green sticker on it. And the first thing I tell the people, that's not the first letter you got because if you got a big green sticker on it, you got 15 more before that. This is the first letter you open. You decide to open, okay? So again, we tell people all the time, just call and make payment arrangement. They can stop garnishment immediately, okay? And once you make a payment arrangement, it'll stop a garnishment. And if you cannot pay, you will go uncollectible. That's one reason to pay yourself in a company. And if you go uncollectible, you are in compliance. You are still in You're in compliance. You can still operate like you normally do. You can stop trying to hide money, put money in the bank, stop putting everything in mama's name. You can operate because they're giving you a chance to get yourself together. So please do not make the payment arrangement. If you can't, you go and collect it, but you have opportunity to still, because they're not going to bother you. They're going to give you a chance, or if you make the payment arrangement, you will be you are in compliance. Okay? Next slide, please. Okay? Now, if you, a lot of our farmers be going to debt, I mean, have lien, one, two, two, seven, seven, 
Once you make your payment arrangement, you ask for a lien to be released. Next slide, please. Uh, 14135, a lot of our farmers have equipment in liens. All right, so make the arrangement. You can ask for a discharge. Okay, next slide, please. If you are any type of agriculture and paying payroll, you only use a form 943. Never use a 941 in agriculture. Annual filing form, agriculture, here's how you pay agriculture payment. Okay, next slide, please. Now, we always want to people to understand. Know what type of business entity you are and understand your requirements. Okay, know what type, that's that EIN number, know what type of business you are. Foundation of your business will determine your tax liability. How are you formed? How are you structured? And always have accurate accountability of your daily operation. One thing that people say is that they almost, they, they almost, one thing that people say, as all the time, what is the best system? Or what can I use to keep up my, my record? I tell people all the time, something you understand. Do not go out here and get the latest version of iCloud, QuickBooks, PM chip if you don't understand. Get you something that tells you two plus two is four. That's what you need, something you understand. Okay, we get this a lot. People have stuff because they're only going to give you what you put in. All daily expenditures may have tax implications in reducing tax income. Ladies and gentlemen, I said to you again, it's not how much money you make, it's how much money you receive, but also how much you, how you legally deduct the taxable income. We got to keep good record to reduce taxable income. We got to understand, I have too many farmers coming in. Not reporting the actual income because they say, I don't want to pay taxes. When we give people this booklet and we show them all their financial statements, they say two things. The first thing they say in this booklet is, I didn't know I spent that much money. The second thing they say when we give them their financial statements, I didn't know I made that much money. Okay? But we tell people all the time, please understand, keep good records and everything you do on a daily basis in agribusiness, men and women. Taxation for us is not January 1st to April 15th. It's January 1st to December 31st, every day of the year. You go to Florida. You say, I'm going to Florida on, on vacation, but I'm two days at trip, I'm going to go look at some farm opportunities in Florida. That two days is tax deductible to you because you conducted business on that trip. So I say this very clearly, ladies and gentlemen. This is the time of year we get ready to pay that pipe. But if our business is structured and our business is organized correctly and we're keeping proper financial records, and understand that we are agribusiness men and women, this time the pipe may have to pay us, okay? So I'll, next slide, please. I want to say thank, thank you. Are there any questions? Are there any questions? Thank you, Mr. Kenny. That was a whole wealth of knowledge <laughs> and a lot of good information. Uh, we do have uh, a few questions we want to take, uh, okay. probably uh, 10 minutes to see if we can sure. get through these. Uh, so we can get through them pretty quickly. The first question, is my family formed a nonprofit in honor of our parents? I have a farm, but the foundation is using my farm. I received funding from NRCS to purchase a hoop house, but the purpose for purchasing the hoop house was for the foundation. I personally do not use the land or hoop house. What taxes do I need to file? It's according to what, what how, did you receive a 1099? If you receive a 1099, the next thing is, what is what, who was the recipient, meaning, did your social security receive it or your EIN number receive it? Okay. So if you receive a 1099, if you receive, if you receive the income, who was the 1099 made to? If it was made to you, then guess what? You have to put that on your personal income. If it was made to your entity, the entity has to report it. But if it was made to your nonprofit, it don't have it has to report the income and the recipient of the income. But remember that a nonprofit, you only claim the income. And your expenses, you showing how the income went to serve the purpose of that nonprofit, and you should have no tax to pay. But the, the answer is who who received the 1099? Okay. Remember that EIN number. Who remember you you can check nonprofit up there, but if you check whoever who received the 1099. All right. The second question, I think you already answered, Mr. Tenney, around the benefits of uh, being an LLC but filing an S Corp. I believe I heard that answer through your presentation. So we'll go to the next question. Uh, mm -hmm. Are value added products considered other income? Yes, it could be. Or you can utilize the expenses in producing that value added. We just obviously Maryland speaker of a group up there, the guy had a juice. Okay. Yes, it could be other income. Yes, it does. You would put that on as you have value added. But remember now, it may be other income, but still you've got to reduce the expenses in producing it as well. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, the next question was around uh, getting in touch with you about crop insurance. If you all see the slide there, it has its contact information. Absolutely. Uh, all right. Next is around conservation expenses. What type of expenses are these? And they say they have been they have been told. Uh, she says I have been told I am on H E L. Can the work I do on my little hillside be placed under conservation? That may be you, more of an NRCS question. <laughs> but I, let me say this: anything you do, is probably, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh no, no, I'm sorry. I was gonna say HEL, I think is highly e highly erodible land. Yeah, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And they do get payments, um, if I'm not mistaken for that. Okay. But remember now, all the payments you receive, what you can utilize the tax deduction, everything you do in working with that conservation program. Mileage, equipment. Anything you purchase, you need to look at all the expenses that you incur on a daily basis in utilizing or meeting that conservation plan or whatever you have to do. I mean, even your cell phone, you know, these are things that are tax deductible to there. So, yes, okay. I will utilize the tax deduction <clears throat> to, to reduce that tax income. Okay. They also ask mortgage interest. Can they apply the cost less interest of putting my house on the land to do to, uh, to this? Well, I would say this, if the house is your name, I'll probably put that on a schedule, say, on my personal side. But now if you're leasing or renting it, you know, and you can maybe include it in a triple net lease, there could be possibility. But if you put my house in the house is my name, I personally would say put it on the schedule A and reduce that on your personal side because it, that would be on you personally, okay? But now you can, now we do have farms that can rent houses, whatever, but I would say put it on your personal side unless it, you operate a farm as a business or you're leasing or renting to the farm. Okay. And can you deduct permit, uh, permits and farmer market fees? Absolutely. Any fees that is costing you to be at the farmer's market, the fuel, the table, the permits, everything. Remember, you still got to sales use taxes too as well now for some who have to pay sales and use tax. Absolutely. Again, everything you do on a daily basis, and when you get in the farmer's market, you buy water, you buy yeti, you buy a hat, you buy shoes because you got to stand all day, all that's tax deductible. Because it's a purpose of you doing business. Yes. Okay. Uh, agritourism. If they have an uh, Airbnb, can the setup of building or the sites uh, be deductible or write off? Yes. Yes. Now, if you're setting everything up, the cost, the fees, the, the maintenance, the cleaning, you know, the cleaning fees, all kinds. Yes. Anything that you do in business or agribusiness to utilize tax deductible expenses, it is tax deductible. Okay. And if you have farm guest house income, uh, so you're not producing anything or buying or reselling, do you still report it on a Schedule F? Yes, you could. Okay, absolutely. You could put it on Schedule E, but I would put it on Schedule F. But remember now, you have farm guest house income, got to have maintenance, got to have cleaning, utilities, or whatever, but it, even driving over there. Okay, this is all tax deductible. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Okay. And there's a question around crop loss. How do you document that? Good records. Okay, making sure if you, as a person asks who wants to uh, about us being a crop center, absolutely. You, it's your records now. It's your records and calling that claim in. But again, you got to go back to your records, now. keeping good records. Okay. Next person has lease that uh, they they have a lease that's in kind. They uh, have their landlord small livestock, but no money exchanging hands. Can they deduct that? Say it one more time. In kind. They uh -huh. have they, what they're now? not paying. They're not paying anything for the lease, but they keep their landlord small livestock, and there's but no money exchanges hands. Can that be deducted? I would say no. If it's not no money exchanging hands, but if you conduct it as a business, you can have deductible expenses there. But if you're saying I'm just doing it in kind as a friend, I would say no. That's not that's not deductible. That's not deductible. Okay. Now, if you start say, well, I think I'm gonna do this as a business or whatever. Yes, but a start, but no. If you're not, it's an economy. Okay, I'm skipping over the questions that were answered uh, in the uh, presentation. So the next question would be, can you change the formation of your company uh, from partnership to an LLC? Absolutely. Remember that form 2553. Now, when you fill that form 2553, we get this question all the time. I'm going to change my EIN. Number. No. You're not changing the EIN number. You are going to change the 
following requirements of the EIN. Remember I said from the beginning, everybody go check the sole proprietorship, partnership, church, whatever. If you recognize that your EIN number following requirements is incorrect, you change the following requirements, not get the new EIN number. Change the following requirements of the EIN number. Great question. Okay. All right. Let's see. Uh, the uh, Thank you, maybe answer this too. The procedure to change an existing LLC or EIN from a sole member to a corporation? It is now, remember now, from a sole member to tax requirements. A lot of people got to understand now. We get this question all the time. I got a LLC, I got an IC. I'm going to get rid of LLC BS Corporation. Remember, the LLC, the INC, is the structure of the state. The S Corporation is your tax filing election. You cannot have an S Corporation without LLC. Again, you're changing the filing requirements. So if I have an LLC and I tax as a sole product, I'm changing the filing requirements of the EIN number. Okay. Okay. There's a question around setting up multiple income streams. So, like having an LLC and a nonprofit to support each other. But remember uh, now, LLC is an LLC, yes. Now, I would say you got to be careful how you use that collaboration because a nonprofit is a nonprofit. Income received that is by a governing board. Now, one thing I will tell people now, you can form a limited liability, I mean, a, a nonprofit. You can say, I want to I want to go out here and I want to teach every kid in North Carolina how to grow tomatoes. Now, the nonprofit can do that. Or the nonprofit can go to that for-profit and say, I got a program that, I, that I'm going to charge a kid. Uh, how much would you charge me to show every kid how to grow tomatoes. Now you can say the nonprofit can lease the land or lease the farm or whatever, and it can receive the money, but it can go out and hire that for-profit to conduct the program and conduct the services, okay? But remember now, a nonprofit is a nonprofit, or LLC is for-profit, be careful how to collaboration, but you can always collaborate, okay? And that's okay. going back to what I'm saying about co mingling funds, never put money person and business money together. So you got to be careful of the collaboration, but you can't collaborate with a non with for profit. Okay. Uh, with an unrelated EIN now going into farming, should I get a new EIN for the farm or is a DBA under the current EIN okay for tax purposes? Well, here's the thing about it. Yes, but I tell people, if you want to do business, if you say I got ABC Farm, but I'm doing business as XYZ Farm, I wouldn't do it. I would do business as ABC Farm. Okay. You don't really need the DBA because the, in it, regardless of whatever name is on that EIN number, that's what you got to file taxes on. Because the name got to match the EIN number. We got people to do DBAs. I say I don't see a reason for the DBAs. Now, if you say I'm a farmer and I'm cutting hair, I'm a barber. Don't mix those two together. Get an EIN number for the farm. Get an EIN number for cutting hair. You don't want to mix the two streams of income. You want to protect the streams of income. Okay. If you click corporation when you file for your EIN, can it be corrected? Yes, because you remember now, if you you can always go back and change the filing requirements. But if you click corporation, the only thing is you're saying I'm filing 1120. It's up to you to determine whether you're going to do an S or a, a regular C 1120. But if you click corporation, you say, look, but you can always go back and change the filing requirements of the EIN. All right. Uh, your contact information is there. Someone's asking for that. If they're asking about how to get that booklet, I think that's for clients, isn't it, Mr. Tenney? Well, it is for clients, but we do have some. We do have some information that we will be putting online. And, and like I say, we serve farmers across the country. We serve farmers through taxation. We serve through crop insurance. And we want to be your your tax accounting firm. We want to be your crop insurance agent. So the ones who actually want to get, uh, ask about the crop insurance, we more than happy to have a conversation. You have my information here, and we have a complete floor here. We have a payroll department, a financial department. We have a tax department. We have the insurance division. So our, our motto is you're in the business and we take care of the company. So we All look right. forward to yeah. being able to serve you. A few more questions I'm going to try to pull together uh, for time's sake. Uh, it's around record keeping. Someone says if they haven't kept, if they just now started keeping records, does that start now or January 1st still? And any recommendations on uh, any apps or things that you know some of your farmers use? Remember, I said something you understand. A, a lot of people use QuickBooks. Yes, you can start January the first now, but now you can always go back because if you haven't filed your taxes yet, you can always go back and pull a record from January first to December thirty first of last year. 
you can always come by that. We do that a lot. We just got a lot of new clients today that we're going back and do this finance from last year. Okay. Now you say, look, two years ago, I didn't, I I, I know I missed a lot. I should have got my fine. We got one we're doing three years going back. And guess what? We're going back and amend those years. You can always go back, collect the records, and amend those years. You can amend the tax return. Okay. All right. Three years, yeah. get this thing over to you, okay? All right. We have a few more questions that if we get time at the end, uh, we'll come back to. Uh, but okay. we do want to give time to our next presenter, uh, sure. Ms. Tia Evans. Uh, Tia Evans has been working with nonprofits for the majority of her career. She currently provides technical assistance and training to help develop cooperative economies across the country. Her background includes working to help farmers secure resources in order to maintain and improve farm productivity as well as creating distribution systems for farmer networks to expand their reach. Ms. Evans is a proud graduate of Morgan State University, and she earned her Jewish doctorate and Master of Business Administration degrees at North Carolina Central University. Ms. Evans? Thank you, thank you. Good to be with you guys here. Uh, it was a wonderful presentation. Uh, one of the best uh, broken down with taxes that, so. So thank you for that. Um, I work uh, with NCBA CLUSA, uh, and I lead a project called Strengthening uh, Cooperative Communities uh, through the American Rescue Plan Technical Assistance Investment Program. Are you able to share the? Yes, I, I would. Mm -hmm. I'm sharing your presentation. Can you all see it now? Tia, I think you're muted. Thank you. Next slide, please. So like I was saying, I'm, I work with the Strengthening Cooperative Communities uh, through the American Rescue Plan Technical Assistance Investment Program. Next slide. A little bit about the organization, um, the National Cooperative Business Association. Uh, we're an apex member association for cooperatives in the United States. Uh, our mission is to develop, advance, and protect cooperatives. Uh, so we do a lot of advocacy work. Uh, our vision is to put co-ops at the center of the conversation around building a more inclusive economy. Next slide. Uh, and a little bit about our work, we're actually, this is our 70th, 70th year um, of international and cooperative development. Uh, we've worked in over 85 countries. Uh, right now we're in the U.S., South America, Africa, and some of Asia. Next slide. We have three practices at our organization, building resilient communities, creating economic opportunities, uh, strengthening cooperatives and producer groups. Um, and through building resilient communities, our focus is on nutrition-led agriculture and food systems uh, framework to design and implement projects aimed at fostering resilience in the, at the local level. Uh, with creating economic opportunities, we focus on the use of economic growth through systems approaches like value chain development, market linkages, agribusiness and enterprise development, as well as marketing opportunities. Um, and then the practice that I work with is strengthening cooperatives and producer groups, uh, where we focus on developing co-op leadership uh, through the use of the cooperative business model. Again, we're working here with producer groups, business planning and management, governance, uh, assisting with financial management, um, as well as legal uh, framework and advocacy. Next slide. Our goal um, through the American Rescue Plan Technical Assistance Program is really to introduce farmers um, through to the USDA programs, uh, provide trainings in financial literacy, uh, market planning assistance, as well as technical support. Our goal is to support historically underserved farmers, ranchers, and their communities by creating a community-led ecosystem. And when we say historically underserved farmers, I just wanted to highlight what that looked like. We have socially disadvantaged farmers, and that's really the race-based American Indians, Asians, Black and African Americans, uh, Native American and Pacific Islanders, and Hispanics. You have your limited resource farmers. Next slide. You can go to the next one. The beginner uh, farmer and rancher, and then finally our veteran farmers. 
Uh, the USDA is made up of 29 agencies and offices. So I have here listed the 15 agencies and then there are 14 different offices with nearly 100,000 employees who serve at more than 4,500 locations across the country. Um, and so it's really important to kind of think about the ways in which the different agencies work. There are a lot of opportunities, op uh, grant funding and loans through the various agencies. And one thing that they want us to highlight is that a lot of farmers, you know, you might go to rural development or you might go to AMS, but what we're not seeing is a lot of the cross linkage between the agencies. And so the idea is really that they should complement each other. You should be working with Farm Service Agency as well as agri Agriculture Marketing Services, in addition uh, to National Resource Conversation Services and Risk Management. I heard somebody talk about crop insurance. Um, please reach out to them. They're really trying to do a few different things. Um, your farm, you can go to the next one, I'm sorry. Your, your farm's business plan is really the roadmap uh, to working with the government. Having your farm business in order is really the key to accessing USDA funding. Um, and your business plan is one of the biggest documents that you'll be asked about as you go into different agencies for funding or banks. Um, your business plan is a formal document that contains your goals and objectives for your business, um, how long it's gonna take you to complete that goal and the strategies that you're gonna adopt in order to reach that particular goal. Uh, it's a living document, so it should change. It should change, you should look at your business plan annually. Um, and then again, reach out to Farm Service Agency. I know Otis and um, Ray here can also assist you but the staff at your, at your local service center, as well as your state beginning farmer coordinator is supposed to be able to connect you to local resources in your community to help you establish a successful business plan. Every time you all reach out to the USDA, any of the agencies, please request a receipt for service at the end of um, your transaction. Even if it's just a call to ask a question, always request a receipt for service because then it'll begin a trail and then they'll have to you know, be held accountable for some of the, what they're saying. Next slide. Your farm's success really does depend on your business plan. Understanding your farm's business can help you speak better about it. When you're going into the banks for funding, when you're applying for grants, you really have to be able to tell the story about what your farm is doing and how these components work together. Um, your business plan will probably address your strengths and weaknesses of your different various family members. Understanding your assets and investments um, creating a retirement and succession plan that's very important to think about what's going to happen to the farm in the next five to 10 years. Um, and then just having a comprehensive plan in place will help to guide the farm when anything um, unexpected occurs. It could be a weather related event, um, it could be, you know, a change in your financial situation. Um, next slide. The initial step in conducting your farm business plan is to think about the strengths, the weaknesses, the threats, and the opportunities uh, that you can foresee on your farm. Completing a, um, a SWOT analysis of your farm business, you can go back, I'm sorry is the first step um, in strategic planning. The process, it should help you identify your areas where your strength and opportunities align with the high probability of success. On the other side of that, you'll also be able to identify your weaknesses and your threats. So your strategic plan should avoid these areas or at least provide an idea to minimize any effect on your farm or business. Uh, it's not something that, the SWOT analysis is not something that you wanna do once. You wanna look at that again annually and complete a new analysis the various the variables will change um, and so it's always good to be on top of that in addition to SWOT analysis feasibility studies um, help answer essential questions about plans that you may have you might think about growing a different crop this year um, and so another we also provide funding feasibility studies I know are very expensive we provide funding for that so if you're looking at should we proceed with the next idea uh, does do you all have the necessary components required for resources and technologies and does your proposal offer a reasonable return um, versus the risk of that particular investment. Um, and so see, some of these things are things that you really want to think about when you're looking for these grants and you're seeking additional funding. Next slide. Um, I kind of want to just go back to a little bit of what uh, uh, Ms. Tenney was saying before. 
these are things that you need to consider before setting up your business, if you have a business, but you have to determine the legal structure of your business, whether it's a sole proprietorship, a partnership, an LLC, a corporation, an S Corp, a nonprofit or cooperative, Mr. Tenney. <laughs> Register your business with the state government. Again, North Carolina, that's just going to the Secretary of State, obtaining your tax identification number from the IRS and your state revenue agency. Those are two different entities you have to do both. Um, and then registered for your state and local taxes is taxes to obtain a tax identification number for workers' compensation and unemployment and disability insurance. Uh, you want to make sure you have all the necessary business licenses and permits, especially as it relates to some of this federal funding. And then also, I always advise talk to an attorney um, or someone just to understand the legal steps that you'll need, especially if you have employees in your business. On the next slide and the final slide, again, to that point, record keeping is so important. Your farm is your business and your financial and production records are going to be required uh, to have an accurate assessment of your business. As he was saying, your financial records are very important for tax purposes. Often when you go into farm service or any of the USDA agencies, they're going to ask for production records or proof of something that I know is three years in a, in a sense with farm service. Um, and so your production records that look like your livestock, the identification weights, dates of birth, et cetera, your crop yields, inputs, fertilizer seeds, um, the labor paid and unpaid, um, and then weather. Um, you can start to predict weather, precipitation, wind, storm events, hills, and snow. So it's really um, best to keep your records. There's no one-stop shop. There's no one be or best way to keep record keeping. In fact, there are various ways that people keep records. Um, and I've seen a number of things. I've seen shoe boxes. I've seen the pen and paper and notebooks. Some folks keep ledgers. To his point, again, if you're going to go with a program, an online software package like QuickBooks or FarmBiz, um, Excel, make sure that it's, some, it's a platform that you understand. Um, and also, you can outsource and hire a professional to help you keep your records. Ultimately, um, if you all have any questions or need any assistance with USDA funding, um, I know Otis is here for you and you can also reach out to us. We do a lot of cooperative development businesses. And so we also have, you know, a little different framework as it comes to like co-op taxes. Um, and so please feel free to reach out to me um, if you all have any questions. All right, thank you, Ms. Evans. I think we have uh, nine minutes left, so I'm going to take five of these minutes to try to get through a few more questions. And um, and sorry if we don't get to all of your questions. We just needed another 30 minutes. This was good information. Um, so I'll get right to the questions. If I did not file a Schedule F for 2022, can I still file an amendment? Yes, absolutely. You go back and file an amendment. And also for people who didn't file Schedule F, you can go back and amend returns or file what they call a substitute um, um, return, Schedule F, okay? okay? Absolutely, you can go back and file Schedule amendment. All right. My sister and I bought the farm and we formed a company, a partnership LLC. Is the mortgage on taxes claimed by the sisters individually or the LLC? Well, it's, again, it's a court of who's paying it, okay? Who's paying it are the this is paying it or the LLC paying it. It's according to who is paying, okay? All right, okay. who is paying? How easy is it to transfer assets, uh, an uh, example, personal car land from individual owners to the LLC and what are the tax implications? Well, if you got if you got any type of liability to finance on, that's gonna be up to the finance company. But is there or if there's any um, debt, you could easily do a quick claim deed or just change the title over to the, to the LLC. Now. If you say what's around, what, what's the benefit? You could carry the appreciation, but now if you change, you change over a 1974 Pinto, that might not add value to it for the appreciation expense now. But it's you got to look at the year to make the model, that record keeping to decide what are you going to change over, what are you going to transfer to the company. But saying okay. real quickly, if you buy a, a car or anything in the company name, it's a difference in being a co-signer and a guarantee for the company. You want to be a guarantor. Now the co-signer, okay? When you first put in cars and coming in, all my companies got cars, all my personal cars in my company's name. You may have to be the guarantor, not the co-signer. And always when you go apply for those vehicles like that, commercial application, not a personal application. All right. How long do I have to amend my return? And can I change my depreciation on equipment? 
Oh, well, absolutely. You got to, you can remain your term for as you want, but you're only gonna get money owed to you for three years. And you only go if you're on a payment arrangement and pay any money, you go back and reduce those tax income. You can get money that you paid in for two years. Okay, for two years. Okay. Okay. What is the tax form for tax exemption? Now, uh, when you say tax exemption, are you talking about the nonprofit that is a 990 or a postcard? Uh, the 1023 is the application. When you say tax exemption, uh, you're talking about, what do you mean tax exemption? Now, you're talking about the state, you know, uh, there's a form that you can apply for the state so you can exempt from tax, but you got to fill, fill out for that now. That's that. But I got to understand what do you mean tax exemption? Okay. And that. yeah, they didn't, that's, they didn't give any clarification. Mm -hmm. Um Another question about can that packet be purchased on your website? <laughs> uh, well, yes, I can say it'd be purchased on my website, but we are going to be updating a lot of these uh, by forms and data because we are going to be putting those out even more, but we will have that up on our website eventually some more information about that. Yes. Okay. okay. Created my LLC for my farm to table restaurant. Do I need to create another one for my farming idea or can it be a DBA part or the, uh, of the LLC? Well, remember now, you said doing business as part of LSC. Now, if you're saying I got to create an LSC for, for, for farm to table, but if you're doing something outside of that, I would not. I would create a, a separate entity now, okay? Say if you said I got my farm restaurant and I got it for farm to table and I got a restaurant. Well, you can create an entity for your farm and the restaurant can buy from the farm. The farm can sell to the restaurant, create two sources of income. You can buy a car in the farm. You can buy a car in the LLC. You create you get credit line, like we say. In the, in, the, in the farm, you got a credit line in the restaurant. So it's according to what do you mean by that? But I would not combine a DBAs, create a separate source of revenue, a separate product, a separate stream of, a separate stream of revenue. All right. Well, thank you, Mr. Taney. I'm sorry, again, uh, that we couldn't get to all of our questions, <laughs> but uh, we did we want to tell you. Call, you. call me. Yeah. Call us. Our office. We got a whole floor here waiting on you. We want to be your firm. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Tenney. Thank you, Ms. Evans. This has uh, been a wealth of knowledge that we have said for a long time that farmers need to understand this side of the business to be viable and healthy and continue to do what we hope you love uh, on, your, on your family farm and able to pass it on to the next generation. Uh, again, we're Raffi, Farmer Color Network. Uh, here's a QR code uh, to, to join our network, to, to be able to get our newsletter. To hear about uh, webinars like this, this is just the beginning of the series that we want to put on this year. Uh, we will be doing events throughout our service area. Otis is, is, is uh, he's down in Mississippi, so we've got folks kind of throughout our area, and we'll and I do quite a bit of traveling, uh, trying to get down to to see our members throughout the area, and uh, and again join our network, get that newsletter, so you can see about more events that we have coming up. We're going to have stuff around plastic culture, farming. Uh, we're gonna have field days that you can come to on site. And uh, and I think what we're gonna hear, Mr. Tenney and Ms. Evans, is we're gonna need to do a part two to this because Absolutely. this is this is good information that, uh, that people need to know. And can I say something real quick? I'll be in Mississippi on Saturday at MMFA, Mississippi, I'm in Shannon, Mississippi, right outside Tupelo. That's where our office is at. And I'm, my office is in Shannon, Mississippi with the Mississippi Bernardo Farm Association, Ms. Carolyn Jones, and I'll be there Saturday. I was supposed to be there today. Our flight got delayed. So I'm headed out in the morning. I'll be there Friday, Saturday in our Mississippi office in Shannon, Mississippi. Uh, okay. In, in our, uh, you know where that's at, Shannon? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm, I'm I'm friends with Ms. Ms. Uh, Carolyn Jones. Jones. Jones Ms. Carolyn, yeah. Yes, I, that's mm -hmm. my office at. Our office is right. We've been there about 10 years. So we we in Mississippi. We cover the whole Mississippi, and also we got the Farmers Ball this year coming up on November third, fourth, and fifth. And we send the same the day I tell you here in the Raleigh. Um, but we have farmers around the country. We send information about them. Okay. Yeah, we hate your flight got council. We hate your flight got council, but we're glad we had you tonight for for as long as you're <laughs> I was going to do it for the, I was actually going to do it for the office in Mississippi. <laughs> so we we'll also want to tell everyone Saturday. thank you. And here again are our names and our, our contact information. Also want to let you know about our farmer hotline. It's a crisis line. So if, you, if you're having issues, you know, storm hits or some type of farm crisis, uh, call this hotline and we'll see what kind of services that we can get you in touch with. And I also want to, uh, Carolina is going to put in the chat a evaluation form. 
And if you fill out this evaluation form, you will be put into a lottery that we will give away a $50 Johnny Seeds card because we really want your input. We want to know how we can do these things more. We want to know the, the topics that you want us to do here again. This is a farmer led organization. Otis is a farmer. I'm a farmer. Um, and so, you know, it's a member, it's a member led organization. So we really want to hear from our membership. We want to hear from you. Uh, so please fill out that evaluation form. And also, if you go and join our farmer net, network, uh, farm of color network, we have 5% um, off. We have a code that you will get to give you 5% off from Johnny Seeds. And we're talking to other uh, companies and, and places that we know that we spend money on getting more benefits like that for our network. So the more people we get to join, uh, like I said, we're 800 members right now throughout the Southeast. The more people we get, gives us more leverage to go to these companies. Uh, and when we're buying drip tape and so on and stuff like that, hopefully we can get some discount for our members. So thank you again for joining. Again, thank you, Mr. Tenney. Thank you, Ms. Evans. And we hope you all have a wonderful night. We ended on time, eight o'clock. Okay, please send your emails too, because we got a weekly uh, tax tip and hot tip right every week. We send over a thousand emails out. So please send your emails and we will add you on to our weekly mail list. We have hot tips go out every week, every Monday morning. Thank y'all. Y'all have a good night. Thank y'all so Thank much. Thank you so All much. Right. Have a All great right. night. All right. Goodbye. Look forward to seeing Mr. Otis down in Mississippi. <laughs> okay. I'll be in touch with you, Mr. Tim. We're going to talk about some Look other forward. things. I'd love to. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye.